Hey, good morning, City Light. Welcome to church. We are so glad to have you. Will you stand and worship with us? We're going to praise our God for his great love for us.
sounds like we praise you, we praise you, and this is what living looks like, and this is what freedom feels like, and this is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you, and this is what living looks like, and this is what freedom feels like. This is uh, Psalm 100, verses 3 to 5. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Jesus, it is our desire to bless your name, your name that stands above all names. May that be our song today. You were the word at the beginning, one with God. Beautiful name. 
Jesus, your name is powerful. Your name is wonderful. Your name is beautiful. Your name is the name above every name. Your throne is over every throne. Your kingdom rules over all kingdoms. You are God. So we submit ourselves to you. We, we bless your name and we bow at your throne. May that be true today. May that be true this week and may that be true evermore. We pray this in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. If you'd remain standing for a moment, I'll read the scriptures over us from Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. This is reading from the scriptures. Go ahead and have a seat. City Light, so good to be with you guys this morning. My name is Doug. I get to serve as one of the elders for our church family along with my good friend Eric and another group of men. We love serving our church. And man, we're so glad you're here with us. It's cold out there, y'all, right? But you're here in the warm building, and your glad hearts are being warmed with the love of Jesus right now. It's so great. We're so glad you're here. Um, hey, if you got kiddos, uh, they are a joy and a blessing and always welcome to worship with us in here. If they need to just talk or run around or anything, Right down the hallway, there is both a family room and a nurse and mom's room. Take advantage of those uh, as much as you need them, and may they be a blessing to you. Hey, we're going to pray for E-Rock before he preaches. If you don't mind, reach out a hand as a sign of support. Say, Eric, we're in this with you, man, and let's pray. Jesus, uh, we're so thankful. Jesus, thank you that your name is above every other name. That at your name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so we pray that even in this sermon today, that you would remind us you are Lord. You remind us that you are good, that you are sovereign, that you reign and rule over all. Would you use Eric and the spiritual gift that you've given him and his personality, his passions, to bring that to life for us, both individually for all of us as individuals in this room, but also for our church family, us together as a family. Jesus, remind us you are good and you are Lord. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dougie. Good morning, City Light. Yes, it is a good morning because we get to dig into God's Word together again. Uh, this January, we've been looking at Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9 that Doug read just moments ago. And we've been looking at uh, what God has to say about anxiety. We call the series Anxious for nothing. And this passage of scripture was written as an encouragement to God's people as we live in an anxious world. Rejoice in the Lord always. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything pray and the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You can think on the things of God. You can act on the things of God and the God of peace will be with you. It's just chock full of encouragement for God's people and I love it. But you know what set up this passage in scripture? Like, you know what verses come just before it that kind of made Paul, the author, think, I should give them some encouragement for anxious times. You know what that was? Let me read it to you. It's conflict. It's stress. It's disagreement. This is Philippians chapter 4, verse 2. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Euodia and Syntyche, not names <laughs> that are popular today, uh, maybe because they're hard to pronounce, 
Maybe because these ladies are known for getting in an argument that they could not solve on their own. They're just on different pages. They can't find a way to move forward together. And word of this conflict spread so far that it made it from the Philippian church um, all in Philippi all the way to Rome into the jail cell where Paul was being held. This was a big deal. In fact, it was so big that Paul, the greatest missionary church planter in the New Testament and maybe of all time, was writing a letter to the church describing the beautiful, foundational, life-changing, eternity-giving truth of the gospel in a letter And this argument had gotten so big that Paul had to spill ink saying, hey, ladies, find a way to get along, right? He, like, used, like, Bible language to tell these ladies, uh, agree in the Lord. Man, they're just forever going to be known as as an example of what not to do. (laughs) I always thought, man, it'd be cool to have your name in the Bible, wouldn't it, if you would have lived in those times? I'm afraid if the Bible's being written right now, my name would be in a spot like this. <laughs> you ever just feel like you've been in a conflict like this? Like, you know, you hear about Euodia and Syntyche being in an agreement that they can't resolve on their own. And you're like, oh, I, I've been there. I've known conflict like that. Like conflict that gets intense enough, other people hear about it and start talking about it. And other people are weighing in on what's going on. Conflict that, that you get anxious about because word is traveling like theirs. Made it from Philippi to Rome. And that anxiety, you think, I am racking my brain. I cannot find a way forward. You ever been in conflict like that? Felt anxiety like that? My guess is almost everybody has in the last few years when political conflict and racial conflict and COVID conflict and all kinds of other conflict just seem to have ruled the day. We cannot escape it at the grocery store, at the workplace, at the school, at home or family gatherings, even at church. It just feels like there's conflict and anxiety that I, you just there is no safe haven. Have you ever felt that? last few years, it seems like that's just been the story. See, I think the details of our lives are different than Euodia and Syntyche's, but the human condition that we face is the same. The, the particular details may be different, but the general condition that we live in is the same. Conflict, disagreement, stress, and anxiety are just as real for us today as they were for them back in their day. And that means that the encouragement in Philippians 4 is just as relevant for us today as it was for them 2,000 years ago. You tracking? Preacher loses breath on that one. Look, it's relevant for us. And so I want to do a quick catch up on what we've learned so far. God tells his people, you can rejoice in the Lord always because Jesus is near and Jesus is Lord. Disagreements and anxiety don't win the day. Jesus does. So Philippians can continue with words like this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When we pray, the peace of God somehow gets active in our lives. It guards us. Imagine Paul writing this letter. He's sitting in a prison cell in Rome, and he's wondering, how do I describe the peace of God to these people in conflict at the church in Philippi? And he looks out, and he sees a Roman guard stationed outside. And he's like, you know what? No matter where I go, that guard is with me. He's stationed here beside me. Nothing gets in to me without having to get through him first. That's kind of like what the peace of God is like. It guards us. It is with us, stationed near us. Nothing gets to us without getting through that first. Paul is saying when we 
pray the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Uh, when the peace of God gets active, uh, getting ahead of myself, I'm just going to. When we pray, the peace of God gets active in our lives. That is good news. There was a pastor who said, the peace of God does not promote passivity. I love that. The peace of God itself gets active in our lives, and then we participate by getting active ourselves. And verses 8 and 9 tell us how. Verse 8 says, think on these things. Verse 9 says, practice these things. So when the peace of God gets active in our lives, we get active too. It affects our thinking and our behavior. Here's verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So when conflict and disagreement and stress and anxiety flare up, what, we, what do we do? We actively think on the things of God. We look for the things of God, hoping to grab hold and set our minds on those things. Whatever we can find that's true or honorable or just or pure, we direct our minds there. As we actively set our minds on the things of God, it impacts our behavior, our life practices. Here's what verse 9 says. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me... Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, last week, I uh, was preparing for this sermon, and I asked my city group to read this verse and just give me first impressions. Read verse 9. What do you think about that? How's it land? And so they read it, they thought for a moment, and then they said, uh, <laughs> that's a pretty bold statement Paul just made there. He's saying to the whole church, what you see in me, do that. It's like he's setting himself up as the example for the whole church to follow. That's a bold statement. And it is a bold statement. But I think before we accuse Paul of pride or arrogance or hubris, we, we should be careful. I, I think here that we'd be wrong to see Paul as a Bible Times influencer just trying to build his brand, okay? I don't think that's what he's doing. Instead, I think this is a man who knows the peace of God in an anxious world and is pointing everybody he knows to the God of peace. I'll say it one more time. I think this is a man who knows the peace of God in an anxious world and he's pointing everyone he knows to the God of peace. I think that's what's happening here. And so Paul lists four things, four uh, ways of knowing things. So he just said, if you find anything lovely or just or pure, honorable, think on these things. And now he's, he's listing four ways of knowing things. So as we Think about the things of God as we know them and internalize them in these four ways. Learn, receive, heard, and seen. Then put those things into practice. And so we're going to look at each of these four items. Learned, received, heard, and seen. Ways we know things. All right? Number one. Philippians tells us to practice the things that we have learned. Now, your first response to what does the word learned mean might go back to like an elementary school classroom with the desks and chairs that are like welded together and you lift up and the pencils are in here and the teacher has a blackboard and chalk. Maybe whiteboard today is blackboard. When I was there, uh, that is one way of learning and uh, similar to what we're doing right now. This is right and good, but I'm not sure that's the only thing Paul's getting at when he uses the word learn. Because just a couple verses after the passage that we're reading here, Paul tells us how he learned, all right? It's a little bit different. So let's read these verses together. Let the Bible help us understand the Bible. This is Philippians 4, 11 through 13. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned, there's our word, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of, of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. 
I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So this passage is saying Paul has learned how to be content in whatever situation he faces. Like in the lowest of times, when he's locked in a prison cell, or when he's beaten for what he believes, or when other Christians are intentionally trying to make his life harder, Paul learned how to be content. Even in the best of times, when new churches are planted, and new leaders are sent out, and hundreds of people are hearing the gospel, Paul had learned how to be content. How did he learn the secret of facing Hunger and plenty, abundance and need. He experienced Christ strengthening him as he faced each of those situations in real life. You see what the scripture is saying? How did he learn that? He experienced Christ strengthening him as he faced each of those situations in real life. So it's one thing to learn a truth sitting in a school listening to a lecture. It's another thing to learn a truth via the school of life in real experience. Have you ever learned that way? I was thinking about this. And back in 2011, the Missouri River flooded. Um, At that time, my wife and I had a two-year-old son and a brand new baby girl, and we lived at the very end of 2nd Avenue. It's a cul-de-sac. Our house was just under half a mile from the river. And we'd been informed that if the levee broke in the wrong place uh, near our house, then we would have about 10 minutes before our house was filled with 8 to 10 feet of water. For a little guy, that's a lot of water right? And so I remember those days, and I thought, man, this flood is threatening my house. It's threatening my property, my finances, my future, even my life and the lives of my family. I remember just overwhelming stress, like unrelenting anxiety. In those days, I I remember just not being able to think about anything else, constantly weighing on my mind. I would go to work and all day wonder if the levee broke, if my wife and kids would get out of the house in time. So stressful. And part of the stress was I knew there was nothing I could do about it. And so for, for weeks, we just lived under this stress. And I remember one night, I took a walk on the pedestrian bridge. It was just right close to my house. And so... I walked over there, I stood in the middle of the pedestrian bridge, and I just looked down at the river. It was higher and wider than I'd ever seen it, splashing on the top of the banks on either side. It was rushing just super powerfully down the middle of the channel. I remember as I stood on that bridge, uh, there were twigs and logs and trees that had all been swept to the middle, and they would fly under the bridge under my feet and they're out of sight in just a moment because the river was going so fast I looked down in awe at what was literally a force of nature ready to be unleashed and at least for the moment was held in by levees I remember just man I'm looking down in awe and stressing about my family What's going to happen? And in that moment, a Bible verse came to mind. Psalm 29, verse 10. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. And I remember looking at the power of the river running underneath me. And I thought, This Bible verse is saying that God sits enthroned over the flood. It's running underneath me. It's running underneath him. These waters may rise, but they will never rise high enough to overtake the Lord who sits enthroned over the flood. Amen? And I think, man, this says the Lord sits enthroned forever. So Rivers may rise and fall, floods may come and go, but the Lord is sitting on his throne so secure in the power of his kingship that a flood doesn't even make him get up, right? He sits enthroned forever. 
And on that bridge, what started is me looking down in awe at the power of the river ended with me looking up in awe at the power of God who sits enthroned over the flow. And I learned something about Psalm 29.10 that day on the bridge that I just couldn't have learned the same way sitting in a seat like this, listening to a preacher like me talk about it. And I'm not saying this is bad. We should do that. That verse never would have come to mind if I never would have read it or heard it before it did. Learning matters in a situation like this. But Paul is saying that somehow we can learn the truth of God in the school of life. In those, in, in those moments, somehow, uh, what I learned about God challenged everything that was causing my anxiety. Man, this river is too powerful. I can't do anything about it. But God sits enthroned over the flow. He's in control. He can do anything about it. If my hands are, if my life are, is in his hands, I'm going to be okay. And all of a sudden, what was a very anxious time, it shifted into a, my heart shifted into a place of peace. My circumstances didn't change, but my perspective on those circumstances did change. Learning the truth about Psalm 29 on that bridge changed things for me. I learned something there. I think that's what Paul's talking about when he tells us to practice what we've learned. So he's saying the Bible isn't just a list of do this and don't do that commands to memorize. Although there are some of those that are good for us to know and follow, all right? But that's not simply what the Bible is. I think here, Paul is saying, practicing what we've learned means living like what God has proven to us about himself is actually true. So let me say that again, just catch it. I, I didn't get anything like quippy and easy, easy to remember because I just don't think that fits here. We like need some nuance. Practicing what we've learned means... Living like what God has proven to us about himself. What we have learned about God from his word and in the school of life, we live as though that's actually true. Let's practice what we've learned. All right? So Paul is not encouraging the church just to listen to what he said and practice that. He's not putting himself as the second Jesus. He's just saying, hey, church, do what I've done and you will find the God of peace. That's number one. What you've learned. Number two, what you've received. Practice these things. What you've received. What does that word mean? Well, let me show you a couple verses again, all right? We're going to let the Bible uh, explain the Bible to us. <clears throat> the first verse is from Galatians chapter 1. Paul says this. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it, there's our word, receive, I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. So I'll just make this point, just one point from this verse. Paul did not invent the gospel message. He did not innovate it. He did not come up with it on his own. He didn't sit down and wonder, what's the best good news I can come up with? And he came up with this one, all right? He also didn't learn it from somebody else that concocted it on their own. This gospel was revealed to Paul by a revelation from Jesus Christ, and he received it. He did not make up the gospel on his own. Okay, that's the first place. Let me take you to one more passage um, in 1 Corinthians. Let's see, what do we learn about this word, received? Here it is. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, there's our word, in which you stand and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. There's our word again. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So here's what Paul is saying has happened. Paul received the gospel when Jesus revealed it to him. The gospel good news that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Jesus revealed that to him and Paul received it. And then Paul went and preached that gospel. He proclaimed it. He spoke it. 
He delivered it to listening people so that they could receive the same gospel that he had received. This is knowledge that is passed on or handed down or handed off. It makes me think uh, about when I was getting to know my wife in college. Um, We would go to the cafeteria and I learned something about her just in the school of life. She likes chocolate desserts, all right? I just noticed that every time she would get dessert, it was some shade of brown and chocolatey. So I pick up. She likes chocolate. I just learned that, school of life. Then one time, I went to her house. I uh, was hanging out with her family, and her mom told me Sarah's favorite dessert are Revel Bars from the Better Homes and Gardens cookbook, 1986, or something like that, right? And uh, that was knowledge that I didn't learn from the school of life. I received it. Her mom told me that and then gave us that cookbook. (laughs) Okay, so we still have Rebel Rebel Bars now and then. You see the difference. Some knowledge is learned by experience. Other knowledge is received. It's passed on. So here's the point I want to make on this one. Christians do not originate the gospel. You do not have to concoct or invent what Christian life and practice looks like. Instead, we practice what we've received. Now, I know that may sound old-fashioned. Because in today's world, it seems like the best advice you can give often sounds something like you've got to live your own truth. You've got to find your own way. Very different from practice what you've received, right? In today's world, feels like thinking new thoughts or innovating new technologies is all the rage. Not practice what you've received. A lifestyle, a belief system that's been handed down and passed on for a couple thousand years. I know it sounds old-fashioned. But friends, this is a big deal. And I think it's a life-changing sort of deal. Because Paul puts the gospel in this category of knowledge that we receive. Paul puts the gospel in the category of something that you learn when it is given to you, when it's revealed to you in his word, right? It's something that we receive. The gospel truth that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. It's truth that's passed on. It's truth that has been the unshakable, unbreakable foundation for God's people to stand on in every circumstance for all time. It's the truth that saves us from sin and death. It's the truth that God has revealed to his people and preserved and passed on for thousands of years. It's endured war and peace, plenty and famine, persecution and favor. It's flourished across different cultures and centuries Friends, receiving that sort of sure, steady, lasting truth is a gift. It's better than inventing something for ourselves. The gospel lasts. It's solid. It's secure. Receiving a truth like that means we don't have to lay the foundation for our own lives, hoping that it does not crack and break underneath us. Instead, we receive God's unshakable foundational gospel truth, and we stand on that. Receiving a truth like that means we don't have to pick from a buffet of truth options and wonder if what we put on our plate is going to get us through life okay. Instead, we can receive the life-giving, sin-forgiving, eternally lasting gospel truth and have assurance that we're saved from the sin that entangles and condemns us. So I'll just sum it up like this. Practicing what we've received means that we reckon the good news of the gospel that's been passed on and revealed as truth. Just what has been opened up and shown to us, what's been handed off and passed on to us, we reckon that as truth and then stand on it as the foundation of our lives. That's practicing what you've received. With me? So number one, learned. Learned is uh, knowledge gained by life experience. 
Number two, received. Received is knowledge gained just by it being passed on to you. And then come heard and seen. Now, I know these things are different, right? We see with our eyes and hear with our ears. It's hearing is like sound waves, vibrations in your head. And light is a particle or a wave. Scientists disagree or can't figure it out yet and hit your retinas, right? Like, they're different things operate in different ways. But they're both ways that we observe the world around us through our senses. They're sens- sensory functions that help us observe life in operation around us. And since they operate the same way, in that sense, I'm going to lump them together here. All right? They're a way of knowing by observation. So let me show you how Paul uses this idea earlier in Philippians. What does it mean to practice what we have heard and seen? Look at this in Philippians chapter 1. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. So Paul is saying that the Philippians who are encountering anxiety, disagreements, conflict, stress, they have seen him endure the same sort of thing. Paul's gone through it. They've watched him get thrown in prison and be attacked, beaten for his faith, all that kind of stuff. They've seen him engage in those conflicts. And when he wasn't with them and he's in prison in Rome, they've heard how that is ongoing in his life. He he endures conflict and disagreement and suffering the same as the people in the church in Philippi. So Jesus is good. Life is hard. Those things are both true. And so when the Philippian church is wondering, when life is hard, how do we get through? What do we do? How do we deal with the anxiety and conflict and stress? What's our next step? Paul says, you can look at others who've endured the same thing and put into practice what you've seen them do. So he says, what you have heard and seen in me practice those things so paul they watched paul defend the faith against angry opponents and pray in every circumstance and get thrown in prison for what he believed they heard how he explained the gospel using the old testament when he talked to the jews how he explained the gospel to the greeks in athens using their altar to the unknown god how he worshiped and sang in his prison cell and god was with him even there They'd heard and seen Paul as they observed his Christian life. And in that sense, I do think Paul was an early influencer, saying, watch what I do and imitate me. In fact, in another place in the Bible, he said exactly that. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Paul's saying that when you see in me evidence that that my life is in line with what you have learned and received in the gospel truth, then practice those things. You can do what I'm doing. And he doesn't limit it to just himself as the one who should be imitated. Look at this passage in Philippians 3. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes, be watching and seeing on those who walk according to the example you have in us. So he's saying anyone that lives a Jesus-loving, God-honoring life can be an example for us to follow, just like Paul was. All right, so for us today, how do we practice what we have heard and seen? Maybe you are like Euodia and Syntyche. Um, You just, when you heard they were in an argument, a disagreement, and they couldn't find a way out on their own, you're like, oh, man, I'm right there. If you've ever been in a disagreement like that, one thing, one way you can put into practice a godly lifestyle is you can look at the Bible and see how did Paul engage in disagreements and conflict. In Galatians, there were other um, gospel preachers who were somehow using gospel preaching to afflict and be rivals to Paul and make his life harder. I don't know how they were doing that, but they were. And in that situation, Paul's like, you know what? I'm just going to take myself out of this situation and rejoice that they're preaching the gospel. 
it makes my life harder, fine. I'll take myself out of the equation and just be grateful for something greater than me. People are hearing the gospel. But there's another place in Galatians where Paul sees Peter, another influential early church leader, doing something shady. And Paul's like, I can't take myself out of this one. I got to step in here. I got to speak in, deal with Peter on this one. So there's all kinds of places in scripture where Paul deals with conflict and disagreements. One way we can live the Christian life is we just look at examples of how Paul dealt with it. And then we follow his lead. We do what he did. Maybe you've just heard the gospel message and you're struck by the goodness of Jesus. He gave his life. For me, he shed his blood for me. He's given me all good things, made me a co-inheritor of the, uh, the, his father's kingdom. There is, in every way, he could be for me and with me and give himself to and for me. He has never held back an ounce. Oh, Jesus is so generous. And I want my life to reflect that. Maybe you just feel that, convic- that, that blend of conviction and inspiration. And you're like, I want my life to reflect Jesus in that way. What, what could we do? Honestly, friends, one thing is you just look around the church and see other people who are doing it. Like, man, who, who is giving themselves for the good of uh, the people around them and the glory of Jesus? Where do they give their time? How do they think? What kinds of things are they saying? I want to observe that. I want to talk with them. I want to learn from them. And I can imitate those things in my own life. We, we listen to how they speak and think and imitate them. So I'd, I'd maybe summarize this one like this. Practicing what we've heard and seen means we watch and listen for people who are honoring God with their lives, and then we put into practice the things we observe. Pretty straightforward. So, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. Friends, I gotta be honest with you. Really practical, tangible sermons like this are just hard for me. I like to say... Jesus is good, let's follow him together, you know, like let's, I get excited about gospel truth and practical stuff, I just like, uh, I do my best, all right? Um, I want to close the way Paul closes this passage, because I think it just, for me, rings in my soul. After all of this practical encouragement, hey, rejoice in the Lord. Pray, think on godly things, practice godly things. He ends with these words. And the God of peace will be with you. And the God of peace will be with you. Friends, we live in anxious times. Like, there's no way out of that. Uh, Doug opened this sermon series with a bunch of scriptures, statistics, and stories that just uh, made a case that we live in anxious times. If you didn't hear that one, go back and check it out on our podcast. We got started and with all these encouragements, right? And yet, sometimes I feel like when we're anxious and dealing with anxiety, it's just really hard to do all those things. Like, when you're anxious and you read, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. You say, I'm I'm anxious. It is hard to rejoice. I don't know how to do that. I I feel so weighed down. I want to rejoice. I just can't get myself there. Sometimes when we're anxious, you, you read the Bible and it says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, pray. And you think, man, I want to do that, but prayer is hard. I've been praying, and I know God hears me, but he hasn't moved yet the way that I want him to move. And so continuing to pray as I continue to feel burdened by this anxiety is hard. Or maybe you're like, man, when I am anxious, the Bible says, think on godly things. And I, I, I'm trying, and when I'm aware, and in my best moments, I, I redirect my thoughts to godly things, but then my default in anxiety is to go to stressful thoughts, and I cannot stop it. Maybe when you're in anxiety, you think, yeah, 
practice these things or I've learned and received and heard and seen do that instead and you feel like you know what trying to change the way I engage is sort of like Doug trying to grow a beard <laughs> right like I could try push out those whiskers it just doesn't work try as I might I cannot do this on my own sometimes anxiety feels so overwhelming that even the good advice the good news in the Bible feels out of reach. I cannot do that on my own. Friend, if you have ever been there, I think Paul knows that we would be reading this too. And he says, I'm not going to leave it at that. Hear this good news. In a world full of anxiety, the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace, it's his name. Why? Because he's the God who lived in perfect peace in the Trinity from eternity past, Father, Son, Holy Spirit in unblemished glory. He's the God of peace because he created this world as a garden, perfectly peaceful, without any hint of conflict or disagreement or sin. He's the God of peace who shut the door to the ark before the storms came and the floods rose. He protected his people and gave them a place of peace. He's the God of peace who led his people out of slavery and into the promised land that flowed with good things like milk and honey. He's the God of peace who entered into the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, so they were not alone and they were not consumed. He's the God of peace because he sat with Paul in his prison cell until he loosed the chains and opened the doors and made a way out. God never left his side. Paul was at peace even in the cell. He's the God of peace who, when he walked on this earth, stood in the boat during the storm. He slept in the boat during the storm. And then the disciples came and woke him. And he told the storm, peace, be still. And even the winds and the waves obeyed him. He is the God of peace who has promised he is coming back to establish his peace once again by finally destroying Satan, sin, and death once and for all and forever. Friends, we live in an anxious world, but the good news that can ring in your soul today and all your days is the God of peace will be with you. Amen? Will you guys pray with me? Awesome God. I thank you for passages like this. I feel like Philippians could have just been a letter written to our church in our time. I thank you that the Bible's not like this detached book that's, that's uh, written for someone else somewhere else and it's just impossible for us to understand. But instead, your word is your revealed gospel truth to us. That we can learn by study and by life experience. That we can receive by your grace a truth that's lasted for millennium. That we can see and hear how others who've known you or follow you do the same. My friends, today, I want you to know the God of peace. And so if, if you know Jesus as your Savior, then this morning I want to invite you right now would you just confess to him what makes you anxious in this world? Maybe right now, confess to him what conflict or disagreement is weighing on you. In this moment right now, maybe just open up your heart and tell him what's stressing you out. Now, friends, in this moment, would you just thank Jesus for being a God of peace, the God of peace? Would you thank him for a whole Bible full of examples of being with his people in the best of times and the worst of times? 
Would you thank Jesus that he is with you even now? He's Emmanuel, God with us. He promised to send his spirit to indwell every believer. Would you thank Jesus that he is who he is? And friend, if you don't know Jesus this morning and you showed up here and you're wondering who he is or what he does or how he works, this morning can I just invite you to know Jesus as the God of peace? When you look around at the world and you think this thing is out of control, my life is is full of anxiety and stress and I don't know what to do about it. Maybe you're like me, standing on the bridge, looking at the river, saying there's a force of nature at work against me that I have no power to stop. Maybe this morning you confess that to Jesus, and you say, I believe that you have the power to do it. I believe that you are the God of peace who can calm the storms of my life. Jesus, I want you to be the king who reigns over my life. I want to bow my knee to you. I want to know your love and your grace and your mercy and your peace now and forever. If you can pray a prayer like that, if you turn to Jesus like that, friend, the God of peace, Jesus Christ, will be with you today and all your days into eternity. Jesus, thank you for loving us, for being near to us, for giving us peace in a world that lasts. We love you, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Friends, we're going to take communion together, and this morning, as we do, I just want you uh, servers, you can come forward and get ready. I just want you to remember how we get the peace of God. Like, when we were sinners, we were living in rebellion against God. Sin is literally turning away from God and going our own way, and then repentance is turning to God and going back to him. And so, we were sinners, rebelling from God and walking away from him, and then he sent Jesus, his son, to live a perfect life that we couldn't live, to die a death on the cross, taking our sin off of us and giving his righteousness to us in its place. Then he was buried in the grave and rose again to make a way out of death for you and for me forever. If you know Jesus like that, then today, as we celebrate communion, the server will break the bread and hand it to you, and you'll remember Jesus' body was broken for you. And then they'll hand you a cup of juice, um, and you'll remember that Jesus' blood was shed for you so that you can have peace with God and know the God of peace is with you now and forever. We will celebrate what Jesus has done this morning. If you know Jesus like that, then come when you're ready. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever leave we live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, oh, we live for you.
every song we could ever sing. We're worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, you are worthy, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you, oh, we live for you, and only there is no one like you, there is none beside.
that we can still see you, hear you in the pages of Scripture. Thank you that we can learn it in real life today. And Jesus, thank you that you have uh, passed it on to us, the faith once for all, delivered to the saints, and then handed down and handed down and handed down. Oh, Jesus, you are Lord. So whatever our circumstances are today, whatever news we got this week, whatever surprise, whatever routine, Jesus, we say into that situation, you are Lord. Jesus, in the thoughts of our mind and the emotions inside of us, we just speak into them, Jesus, you are Lord. And now we will practice that, Lord. This week, we will live as though it's true because deep down, it's been revealed to us and we know it is true. You are Lord. We bless you and we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. City Light, go ahead and take a seat. And uh, E-Rock, my friend, great job this morning. But just, you guys, listen, you weren't in the 9 o'clock. Most of you weren't in the 9 a.m. gathering. Here's what happened in the 9 a.m. Eric stood up here and he preached the gospel message with passion and conviction and grace towards his dear friend. This, in the 11 o'clock, which you guys were in, you heard. Eric stood up here and he preached the gospel with passion and conviction, and then he threw his dear friend under the bus. You saw it, right? Sometimes our experience of the God of peace is like Doug trying to grow a beard. And I was like, man, where did my knees go? They just got taken out from under me. Help me know. It was awesome, man. And sometimes, bro, like I try to grow a beard. And sometimes experiencing the peace of God is like that. It just like doesn't happen, you know, no matter what I do. But what a promise, Eric, what you did do is you laid out, here's some practical stuff for us, but then you came back and like the gift God has given you, you inspired us to go, listen, here's the promise. Here's what we can hang on to. The God of peace, not just the peace of God, but the God who owns all peace, created all peace, he will be with us. And that's a promise I can hang on to. Whether I ever grow a beard or not, and let's be honest, in my 40s, it's just not going to happen. So I will trust the God of peace instead. So, hey, always a joy to be with you guys. Let me share a few announcements before we split out, uh, because we'd love for you guys to be a part of our church family beyond just the gatherings. First thing is, if you are new with us this week or the last few weeks, and you're just kind of getting to know us a little bit, we're just honored you're here. Thanks for taking some time out of your busy schedule and saying, hey, I'm going to go check out that church. Are they weird? Are they normal? You know, do that thing. Or maybe you're like, I'm going to go just sing my heart out to Jesus because I already know Jesus and I want to be a part of a church family. Wherever you are on that spectrum, we're glad you're here. We'd love to get to know you a little better. And a simple way to do that is hop on your phone. Go to citylightcb.info. Really simple web, web page where you can just sign up and say, hey, I want to get connected. Here's my email. Send me the weekly emails that say here's what's happening in our church. Or you can ask questions of us. What do you believe about this? Can you send me info about kids? You know, anything you want, that's the way to get connected right there. A uh, couple things you might want to be a part of. Let me just tell you guys, this Tuesday evening, we're doing a feast night, okay? We're going to feast on some food at 530 and then feast on the presence of God at 630, worshiping Him together. All month long in January, we've called it our like month of prayer and fasting as a church. It's been great. Many of you guys have participated by praying along with our prayer guide. Some of you, you've skipped meals or skipped uh, multiple meals in a day or in a week. Maybe you gave up a particular food for the month, whatever it might be. 
And we did that fasting so that we could like get in tune with our hunger for God. We need God more than we need calories, that sort of thing. So it's been powerful for all of us. And we just said, how are we going to wrap this month up? And we said, let's do a feast night. So that is this coming Tuesday evening. At 5.30, we are going to feast on food. It's awesome, guys. I know the team, we've got like seven or eight people who are preparing that meal for us. We're going to have soups, chilies, homemade breads, homemade desserts. It's like the menu came straight out of the kingdom of heaven, guys. And it's going to be here on Tuesday night. You want to be here for it. It's going to be awesome. And then at 6.30, we're just going to gather and we're going to sing our hearts out to Jesus. Full band, just singing and praising him and saying, Jesus, you are over all. You are in all and you are through all. Man, it's going to be awesome. If you can't make it for the food part at 5.30, no biggie. Just come at 6.30 and worship with us. Also, child care is provided for that. But at the same time, your kids are welcome just to come, eat with you, sing with you, celebrate with you. We want you to be a part of it. Here's what would help us a ton. If you could hop on citylightcb.info and just RSVP within the next two hours or so, that will help those awesome, the team of chefs and cooks who are making the meals, that will help them know tomorrow and Tuesday how much to prepare. Okay? We will make as much as we need. Just please go RSVP. That would be awesome. Okay. The other thing, uh, next Sunday, we start a new series of sermons. And we're going to be tracking through the Old Testament books of First Kings and Second Kings. It is old school history of God's people. In those books, really, more than anything, the theme is how patient God is towards his people, even after they mess up and mess up and mess up. Those kings, there's 42 kings in the books, and so many of them, they just mess up, and God is patient and patient and patient. So that's the theme of it. Now, what we're going to do next Sunday night is what we call a deep dive. Deep dive into kings, where we're going to look at the historical background, the timeline, like the culture at that time. What's the outlines, the structure of these books. It is glorious, awesome Bible nerd stuff. And we love it. We would love for you to be a part of it as well. The people who have come to Deep Dives in the past, the, the feedback we often get is they're like, man, this helps me understand the sermon so much better. It makes all the experience on Sunday mornings richer and more full. So sign up for that also at citylightcb.info. You can RSVP there. And child care is also provided for that should be awesome. We'd love for you to be a part of it. Um, Last thing is, man, as God is working in you and through you, if you want to be a part of our church's mission financially by giving generously, um, the mission of our church is to multiply disciples and churches. And the day in, day out operations of that just, it has real costs that go with it. So if you want to contribute to those costs, you can give by dropping check or cash or anything we can liquidate in that giving box on your way out. You can give online at that citylightcb.info or mail a check to this address right where we are at the moment. Good church. All right. You guys stand with me. Let me send you out with a good word. City Light, take heart this week as you follow Jesus. Philippians 4 says that the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And it says the God of peace will be with you. Love you guys. We'll see you Tuesday.